Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is July 17, 2021, and this weekend we're doing a marathon of Hanging with the Sock Dem Gang clips. Basically, this is when I go over to the Secular Talk YouTube channel and click on their channels tab, and then there are several dozen other YouTube channels that Kyle Kalinske promotes, and they're all kind of in the same social democratic or Sock Dem vein. So... I have been grabbing current events clips and then just commenting on them. We've done four of those so far. While we're doing this, the last clip that I just did was one from the David Pakman show. Pakman is one of my least favorite people on this list. I think he's one of the furthest right among these kind of left liberal social Democrats. Anyway, this particular one is less of a current events clip, which most of these are. And that actually serves a double purpose. It gets me caught up on some current events, but... Anyway, this one is more of an ideological one that actually a viewer sent in to me over Twitter. So thanks for that. And this is David Pakman. The title of the video is Why I'm Not a Socialist. And let's just watch it. I've only watched about a minute of this. The rest will be just a cold viewing and response. So last week we talked about democratic socialism versus social democracy. And I talked to you about how, especially since Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's win in New York, there has been sort of more and more confusion as to what is democratic socialism versus what is social democracy. And I did a story explaining the difference. Democratic socialism is actually socialism, wants to remove capitalism and replace it with socialized ownership of the means of production, at least originally, although now there are people who say, well, they're still democratic socialists, but they don't actually want that, which makes me question whether they're actually democratic socialists at this point. Okay, so far, basically, that's fair. Um, I haven't talked about this for a while on the channel. We were talking about this a lot back about a year and a quarter ago when the Democratic primary was still going and Bernie Sanders was still kind of a thing before he rolled over for Joe Biden. Basically, you had Bernie Sanders saying that he was a Democratic Socialist. Now, any in that case, in that phrase... Democratic is the adjective and socialist is the noun. When it comes to social democracy or a social democrat, someone who believes in social democracy, social is the adjective and democracy is the noun. And by democracy, they mean capitalism, which of course isn't democracy at all. Capitalism is inherently very undemocratic because most of the decisions um, around economic activity are made by the 1%, or maybe the 10%, if you want to include the petty bourgeoisie, small business, you know, small employer class. But really, even there, they're being led around by their vendors and things like that. So, and then beyond that, I mean, financing of things is definitely concentrated in the hands of very, very few people, for the most part, of, you know, anything of real consequence. So it's not very democratic. And then beyond that, within that system, those who have the money can buy the politicians and then they have political power as well as the economic power. So really economic power is where you get political power from. All right. So democracy, quote unquote, or capitalism, which is not democracy at all, but to capitalists, I guess it is. That's a situation where the capitalist class is the ruling class. Socialism is when the working class is the ruling class. You can still have some limited amounts of capitalist type activity. I mean, some people would debate you on that, but I would say that the prime qualifier for socialism is that the ruling class is in charge and the capitalist class is being suppressed. And if they're serious about moving beyond capitalism through socialism into communism, then that capitalist class should be progressively as much as is possible. I, I guess sometimes there are times when you need to take a step back just due to global conditions and allow more capitalist activity. But the idea is that you eventually want to get rid of all of it, though you don't have to get rid of all of it immediately to qualify for building socialism, just suppressing the capitalist class and not allowing them to rule your society. Otherwise, you're back to capitalism and the rulership or the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie.
the capitalist class, rulership of the capitalist class. That's what dictatorship of the bourgeoisie means, whereas dictatorship of the proletariat means the rulership of the working class. Okay, so social democracy, it is capitalism, but it is somewhat socialized. Capitalists are still in charge, but they're regulated, and there's some redistribution of wealth and public services and things like that. But the capitalists are still in charge, make no mistake. Now, side note off of this, why I'm not a social democrat is, how do you get this state where the capitalists are willingly relinquishing some of their own power? Yeah, so that's a huge question, uh, leading to some important answers. But it's basically that question that is, you know, why I'm not a social democrat. Because while there's plenty of people out there in this whole suck them gang who will tell you that, oh, no, bro, social democracy is the best, uh, Sweden, Denmark, blah, blah, blah. How did you get that social democracy? Like, how did you, how did you get the capitalists to give up that power and make those concessions? Which, incidentally, since the early 90s, when the Soviet Union was destroyed against the objection of 75 plus percent of its population, we have seen a rolling back of that entire New Deal in the U.S., but it's not just the U.S. and Western Europe as well. All of the social democracies, they experienced a rollback of those social de democratic benefits and the safety net because there's less pressure on the capitalists. So the capitalists' natural interest is just maximal profit, and if they could have slave labor, they would, you know, and just pay you nothing. So they have their system. They want maximal profits. They don't want to make concessions. It's not in their interest to make concessions. Like, they don't have to. The only way that they ever did is when we made them. And honestly... Setting sights on revolution and having revolutionary states active in the world was the only thing that made them go, hmm, maybe we should try to buy off our populations, which is basically what social democracy is. It's capitalists trying to buy off their working class and their petty bourgeoisie, the small business class, so that they, the capitalists, stay in power. Why would you support that? when the only reason we even got it was through the militant struggles in the United States in the 1900s, 19-teens, 1920s, 1930s, of socialists, communists, anarchists, radicals of all types, people who were fighting and organizing for an end to capitalism. It was only that end to capitalism threat that, you know, it was only by that that any of the social democratic reforms really came into place. Otherwise, they would have just kept ignoring us. They would have had no reason not to keep ignoring us, you know, as far as their own interests go. It's only when you directly threaten their power that you get the concessions. Although, as I've said before on the channel, if they're offering concessions, it means that they're scared for their power. So keep pushing because you may get the power, right? That's what we want. Revolution is a change in the ruling class. Not a ruling clique, but who is the ruling class? Capitalist or labor? We want the working class to be the ruling class and then to suppress capital and make capitalism a memory. All right, so what's a democratic socialist then? We got socialists, somebody who wants to move away from capitalism, but what is a democratic one? So this term is super murky. Um, you could find some people referring to themselves as democratic socialists in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Basically, these were like anti-Stalin, anti-USSR, socialists of some type or another, mostly in Western Europe. And they'd say, oh no, you know, we don't like that bad authoritarian socialism. We're democratic socialists. So that's one type of democratic socialist. Now, whether there's any validity to that, uh, you know, or not, <laughs> we'll leave that for another video. We've, we've talked about that before. I would say at a minimum, that entire narrative of authoritarian versus libertarian or democratic socialism is overblown at best. We'll say that for now. Now, I would say that there are two other meanings or major definitions of democratic socialist as well. One 
you could say that democratic socialists are socialists who think you can vote in capitalism. In other words, socialists who primarily concentrate on electoral politics and kind of eschew revolution. They say, oh, revolution's not going to be possible. Let's not organize for that. Let's try to take over the bourgeois government and do things like that. While Marxist Leninists, if you read State and Revolution, for example, that's my recommended intro work to this whole thing, then go back and read some other things on the list. But I find that that work has probably the most answers that people today want to know. Anyway, the idea of Marxist Leninists is we need to smash the bourgeois state and then create an entirely new government. Marxist Leninists are not necessarily opposed to working in bourgeois governments where we can be elected to agitate in different ways. However, that is not seen as the pathway to revolution. And even that is controversial, what the role of you know, running candidates in bourgeois elections even is. You will find a lot of disagreement about that. What everyone does agree on is that the bourgeois state needs to go and it needs to be replaced with something entirely new. So simply taking over the government, is the bourgeois government, the capitalist government we have now, that's, we all agree that's not the way. All right, so you could say that there's the second definition of democratic socialist as a kind of anti-revolutionary socialist. Now you could say a revolution is any kind of change in the ruling class, whether it's peaceful or not. However, this kind of democratic socialist, we could say there's an emphasis on this sort of gradual incremental approach. All right. The third definition is basically social democracy. There are, the third use of democratic socialist, I would say, is just a perversion of the term or a distortion of the term. People who mean social democracy, but say democratic socialism. Now, there is some overlap and confusion here, because even if you get someone, a socialist, whose goal is to end capitalism into the government, what they're going to be able to do in practice in a capitalist government may be indistinguishable from the activities of a social democrat, somebody who doesn't want to end capitalism, but does want to regulate it or restrain it. In practice, a lot of their efforts might look really similar because there's only so much you can do within the capitalist government, and that's why Marxist-Leninists want to completely get rid of it and replace it with a new form of government for workers. So it's, you know, it, it is a little murky, and that's part of why there's so much emphasis on reading and study within Marxism is because these aren't simple answers most of the time, and when you let vocabulary terms out into the real world, People use them in all kinds of ways, both, you know, in well-meaning ways, deliberate perversions, and then just sort of sloppy and ignorant usage. And we have to cope with all that, you know what I mean? And we can cope with it. So that was me unpacking all of this for you um, and trying to elaborate a little bit on what Pacman said. I think it's not necessarily as simple as, you know, the DSA people are all just social Democrats like I said, I think that in practice, well, first of all, stop endorsing the Democratic Party. It's a complete dead end. Even if you want to do this kind of, you know, uh, reforms to the capitalist government, you're not even going to get them through the Democratic Party. So there's that. But also, you know, we don't know what is the goal, actually, whether somebody is a social Democrat or a socialist who thinks that they can work in the capitalist government. In other words, we don't know what's in somebody's heart. Do they really want to end capitalism or, you know, do they just want to restrain it? This to me is the distinction between a socialist and a social democrat is what is your goal? So at some level, we can't know, you know what I mean? Uh, unless people say out and out that they're one way or the other. And even some of the people who say that they're a socialist may be lying, you know, to gain support and mislead workers. This happens constantly throughout the history of socialism. But anyway, democratic socialist. Yes, you could say that in the last five years since Bernie Sanders, more people in the U.S. in particular have been using this term than maybe ever before in U.S. history. But what each person means may vary, you know. And I think that 
the way that I would refer to it, you know, Bernie Sanders, what does he want in his heart of hearts? Does he want to end capitalism? I mean, I'd say if so, he's doing a shit job and he's using terrible tactics. I don't know. I can't see into his heart. You know what I mean? But the bottom line is that Bernie Sanders, quote unquote, isn't just Bernie Sanders. There was a coalition around that when that was a thing, when he was actually running. That coalition had a right wing, which was more social Democrats, and it had a left wing, which was more actual socialists. I know because I was one. So it is a spectrum. And just, you know, keep in mind, these things can be a little bit fuzzy. It really kind of varies from person to person. In fact, that's one of the purposes and aims of this channel, to do more Marxist, Marxist-Leninist education so that we can increase the cohesion, reduce that ambiguity, vagueness, and confusion. Speaking of, back to Pacman. And then on the other hand, we talked about social democracy, which is a progressive movement that wants to work within a market economy, within capitalism, and make it more of what I call a socially guided market economy. And the difference is massive. And the confusion between these two systems is very, very problematic. And the top response that I got from people in the audience was, I mean, of course, other than trolling, was what's your position, David? And I've mentioned before that I'm not a socialist. I'm a social Democrat in the sort of Nordic or Swedish tradition. And today I'm going to explain to you why I am not a socialist. And I'm happy to do this. It's something that's been an area of study for me since undergraduate and even even including in graduate school. And I'm going to start sort of at the end and then we'll walk through it. OK, a couple things before he gets going. One, remember that socialism is the rulership of the working class, a.k.a. the dictatorship of the proletariat in older language. So one reason that people may not be socialists is that they are not working class. Therefore, they would actually lose power and standing in society were there a socialist revolution. So that may be one reason. If you're a rich liberal, you don't want to lose your power, which you would in a transition to socialism. So that's one reason that people are not socialists. I wonder if he's going to mention that. He has talked about how much money he makes before, and I do suspect he would uh, lose out in socialism. Now, there are some wealthier people who can look past their own direct interests and see that capitalism isn't sustainable, it's unjust, it's not good for society. There are some people who are just compassionate enough to realize, like, it's a parasitic, exploitative, cruel, abusive system. And they can say, okay, I personally would lose, but I recognize that this is better for everyone. I'd say that those people, unfortunately, are a minority because, I mean, it's a psychopathic system, you know, it's a system based on exploitation. And um, to a certain extent, you have to be kind of psychopathic to perpetuate a psychopathic system. At a minimum, you need to turn a blind eye to the reality of the horrors that your system is creating. But that's not always possible. And sometimes people just have to think up justifications, rationalizations, and an ideology, a psychopathic ideology, to be okay with it. Bottom line, capitalists are a small minority. Maybe, depending on how you're defining them, 10% at most of the population. So, you know, to make an analogy, let's say you're having a barbecue and there's food all out on the table. You know, we're in summer now. You've got your potato salad. You've got fruit. You've got burgers. You got whatever you got going on. And um, there's 18 people there. And then two people additional show up and uh, they are carrying a wheelbarrow. And then those two people um, load up 90 percent of the food into the wheelbarrow and then try to leave. Well, what do you think the um, other 18 people would do? So there's a situation where 10% of the people at the party tried to take 90% of the food. What do you think would happen? Well, for some reason, that's how we let the whole of society be run. That's capitalism. Now, to expand on that, quote, for some reason part, 
To make it a little more accurate of a metaphor to track with capitalism, let's imagine that those two people with the wheelbarrow showed up surrounded by a throng of like five or six people wearing body armor, armed with automatic weapons, tear gas, etc. That would substantially improve their chances of extracting 90% of the food from the table and leaving. That's a little bit closer to what goes on. So... I don't know how you could not be against that unless you're one of the people carrying the wheelbarrow. (laughs) So anyway, the second point is what he's talking about with the definitions. We recently did the first part of a series called Understanding Richard Wolff. Richard Wolff, when he gets into debate or, you know, um, contentious interview situations, he often gives three definitions of socialism. Basically, I would say that they amount to social democracy, socialism or communism, and anarchism. While you could say that there are some socialists who felt that the best that they could do at some particular time, sincerely, was to do some reforms and try to introduce some form of social democracy, you know, I pushed back in the Wolf videos about how valid that is you know, Marxist-Leninists consider this revisionist and anti-revolutionary, and there's a lot of pushback on that that Richard Wolff rarely brings up. And then you get a lot of social democrats like David Pakman. Most of them don't want to be called socialists, and they don't see what they're doing as socialists. I remember meeting somebody from Sweden years ago, and, you know, this was before a lot of things, and it was like, oh, you know, uh, is, that, uh, is that a socialist country? And she's like, no. She's like, no, socialism is what they do in Eastern Europe. We're, we're a democracy. So they don't really particularly like <laughs> looking at it as socialism. Yes, there have been debates within the Marxist world about how much is possible and when. But um, anyway, this just reminded me of that whole discussion and why it may not be super helpful to um, continue to do what Richard Wolff is saying. Although it, I see why he does it. It's convenient for the purpose of those interviews and conversations. I think it's a, at least an oversimplification, though, for sure, and can be misleading. Anyway, enough of that. Back to Pacman. Fundamentally, I'm not a socialist because I want an egalitarian, free, self-determining society. Okay, Um, capitalism is not going to give you that, let alone the fact that the version of capitalism that you want was never created without the threat of socialist revolution. Like, that's the only reason you got it. Amazing, amazing. And then since the late 70s, 80s, we've had different capitalists who say, nah, fuck social democracy. Let's just get, you know, more determined and uh, dig in harder like that. You know, it used to be that they made concessions to avoid revolution. And they were like, no, I think we can just, you know, bare knuckle it. And um, anyway, they've been just digging in. So I did listen ahead because he keeps in this section just saying and, 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 and I couldn't find a cutoff point. Get ready for some bullshit because he just loads it up and then drops a Venezuela. And that type of society will not emerge from authoritarian apparatus. And what that means is that at the national level, socialist and communist structures are fundamentally authoritarian. And at scale, enacting socialism or communism becomes authoritarian and a top example is Venezuela. Let's assume in good faith that the Chavez Maduro goal was a truly egalitarian, free, thriving society. I don't know if it was, but let's be charitable, right? And they really did want that as the end goal. When you put aside the populist collectivist rhetoric of that regime, The Venezuelan regime is an authoritarian imposition of government without all sorts of freedoms, lacking in press freedom, lacking in judicial freedom. It's a long list and I'm opposed to it. And whatever their intentions were, their imposition of those intentions in this authoritarian way 
has led to absolute disaster. And some socialists, Leninists, will say that the opposition to the Venezuelan regime is American astroturf or that the replacement to Maduro might be worse. Step back for a second. An authoritarian apparatus will not lead to an egalitarian, self-determining society, period. Every arm of global imperialism, it's the muscle, it's the enforcer, it's the thug that does most of the dirty work and the heavy lifting of violence. How do you feel about that? How does this fit into your theory of, you know, global sock dem revolution? How can we fit that in? <laughs> How can we <laughs> level things out? So dealing with reality, which is what we're trying to do over here, and not idealistic fantasies. How actually do you get from point A to point B? Let's say you're Venezuela. Let's say that the second that you, your national leadership disobeys U.S. headed imperialism, that you're going to be hit with sanctions and many, many, many threats of coups, assassination attempts, attempts at overthrow, on and on. And over like lack of press freedom, do you think that's justified? Do you, you know, for all this talk of democracy and whatever, you're in the United States. Is like, so again, I, I think this guy was even, I think he was for Elizabeth Warren, like not even Bernie Sanders for fuck's sake. This guy wants to just keep living his lifestyle and pointing a finger and punching down. That's basically what he's advocating here. Venezuela. It's amazing. Also, all these things. Does your country have those things? Do you have real press freedom? Do you have a functioning press that I, I guess he would say that we do? We don't have these things here. So at best, this is pure ideology. And, you know, at uh, I think more accurately, this is just class warfare, counter-revolutionary talk right here. But before we get to all of the conclusions, we need to talk about what we mean when we say socialism or communism. When did it start? What does it actually mean? So for our conversation today, when I talk about socialism, I'm talking about modern socialism and communism in the tradition of the 19th century. And if you go back to our socialism has never worked debunked video, we mentioned older societies and sort of collectivist iterations of economic arrangements. But for today, we're talking about modern socialist theory, and that dates back roughly to about the 1800s. And there are three main lines of socialist theory. Almost no one who likes to talk about socialism on the Internet actually knows about this stuff. Not true. Uh, and we are growing in numbers all the time. I say that this is our decade that I use the hashtag Revolution 2030 because I think that the actually socialist left is going to be rising this decade. And I think we will have some kind of moment by 2030. So, you know, in, enjoy your smug, like overconfidence, David Pakman for now. We are coming. There are 3,000 people in this audience and there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of other channels like this one that actually teach Marxist theory. And every person that learns this stuff and, and learns to see through your bullshit is handed a machete that we can hack right through it and you're it's not going to hold up. So enjoy your time while it lasts. This is really important. This is the nuts and bolts. First, you had the utopians in the 19th century. These are people like Saint Simon, Fourier and Owen. And their idea was that there would be the development of these collectivist, egalitarian, sort of perfect, as the name utopian implies, societies sometimes in isolated enclaves and they would eventually spread. And I actually do believe that individually they can work. But once you say this is the system for the country, 
it becomes authoritarian in its implementation. That's your objection? That even if things are fair and people are happy, you can't do it because it's, quote, authoritarian? I'm dumbfounded. So th this is a, a part, okay, I'll come back to right now for a short comment, because I don't think that the whole authoritarian thing has much merit or deserves much attention on its own. Authority, like all societies run on force. <laughs> Government is institutionalized, authorized force. Every society does that. Capitalism couldn't run without massive, massive police forces to repress the population and ensure that the inequality that capitalism creates is not overthrown, overturned. The fact that you would say, not that, oh, it wouldn't work. He's like, oh, I think it actually could work. But when you do it throughout society, then you're telling people what to do. So this is just, you want freedom for exploiters, is what it sounds like to me. You want the freedom to exploit other people if you think you can profit from it. That's not a freedom anyone but you wants and the very few other people who think that way. Most people don't think that way. And regardless, you can't have a society, even if everyone thought that way, you can't have a society where everyone acts that way. There's always a small exploiting class and then the majority of exploited. And people are kept in that role of being exploited by force, authority, institutionalized power. So this whole thing just falls flat. I mean, that to me, it's just even when you get into, you know, some of the most anti-authoritarian anarchist forms of thought. As soon as you like get into, well, how are we going to take and maintain power? You start like recreating the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the worker state again. Like, I just, um, I don't know why people keep going for this. I guess it's just heavy liberal individualistic indoctrination and like, hey, what about my, you know, chance to enter this lottery to become one of the rich exploiters? I can only assume that that's what it is, but it's a hollow argument on any level. If you're really interested in freedom, wouldn't you be for an economic system that creates conditions such that most people actually have economic security, etc.? And again, I mentioned before, you know, I don't know what to do with this argument in a lot of ways because it's so vague. You, you have to talk about it in more specific terms, like authoritarian in what way? You can't just say that as a blanket principle and have it mean something like liberty is a relative term. Always. It's compared to something else. And at a certain point, it's good enough. And if you want to say X, Y, Z isn't good enough. You should be able to say specifically why. But again, you just can't do anything with it's authoritarian as a blanket statement, which is probably why they throw it out there. Let's um, listen on. This is, I, I was expecting better. But I don't know why, but uh, this is like shit tier arguments continuing. You'll develop conflicts between these utopian enclaves. But as usual, there was some good stuff proposed there, okay? Their theory applied to an individual company or a commune or a village. It's actually a pretty good idea. I've just not seen evidence that utopian theory can apply to a country of 300 million, for example, but I'm willing to have my mind changed. After the utopians came the anarchists, the sort of second wave, second line of socialists. And the main thing with the anarchists was that government is the problem. They were actually a lot like the more extreme libertarians of today for different reasons than libertarianism. The anarchist socialists saw the government mostly as an apparatus that reinforces the status quo of class divisions, bourgeoisie versus proletariat, or today we could say corporate versus individual interests or elites versus everybody else. And, and uh OK, he just threw that in there. I don't know if that was deliberate or out of ignorance, but no. 
Bourgeoisie and proletariat are not equivalent to elites and everyone else. That's not the same. Understand very clearly. So bourgeoisie means the wealthy people. That is, uh, well, it means people who own capital specifically. The proletariat is a very specific thing. This is if you read early Marx and Engels, they made a real point of honing in on this term. So proletariat. I'm going to read you the first couple of sections from the Principles of Communism. This was basically the forerunning document to the manifesto, the Communist Manifesto. So, one, what is communism? The answer, communism is the doctrine of the conditions of the liberation of the proletariat. Two, what is the proletariat? The proletariat is that class in society which lives entirely from the sale of its labor and does not draw profit from any kind of capital, whose weal and woe, whose life and death, whose sole existence depends on the demand for labor, hence on the changing state of business, on the vagaries of unbridled competition. The proletariat, or the class of proletarians, is, in a word, the working class of the 19th century. Three, proletarians then have not always existed? No. So, commenting... This is a new class to capitalism. Continuing, there have always been poor and working classes, and the working class have mostly been poor. But there have not always been workers and poor people living under conditions as they are today. In other words, there have not always been proletarians any more than there has always been free, unbridled competitions. The last point for how did the proletariat originate? The proletariat originated in the Industrial Revolution, which took place in England in the last half of the 18th century, 1700s, and which has since then been repeated in all the civilized countries of the world. It was precipitated by the discovery of the steam engine, etc. So, ending the little excerpt from Principles of Communism, the point is that pro- the Capitalism creates proletarians. These are dispossessed workers who own nothing but their labor. Labor is the only thing that you have to sell to get by in the world because the big capitalists have collectivized industry and all the handicrafts and things have become obsolete due to technology. And so people get pushed into a place where they own nothing and just live off of their labor. And the whole idea of Marxism is that Capitalism eventually reduces all but a tiny minority of people to proletarians. And those proletarians owning nothing have nothing to lose but their chains. In other words, at that point, you can take all of this very centralized, privatized industry and just make it public so that everyone, all the proletarians can share it rather than having it be privately owned by this class No, no, no. You just hold it in common. That's the idea. And that capitalism lays the groundwork for this by impoverishing everyone in the specific way that it does. People, individual people, no longer own the means of production. A handful of capitalists and capital groups own all the means of production, factories, workplaces, etc. So that's important. It's not the same as the elites versus everyone else. It's much more specific than that. And, you know, Pacman on his little high horse here about who knows what about socialism just had a massive fuck up. So anyway, let's continue. Uh, uh, Libertarians, of course, oppose government for different reasons, but there was actually a similarity there. And that also doesn't appeal to me. As most people know, I'm against this on principle. I think that the government does have a role to play. But that being said, the anarchists had some valid critiques. Governments often do become pillars of support for corporate rule. They do reinforce the status quo. They do reinforce power structures. I've seen no evidence that eliminating the government is the solution in the way that the anarcho socialists or the libertarians believed. Super interesting that even though now libertarians and socialists are mostly diametrically opposed. Some of the original strains of socialist thought had a lot in common with libertarianism. Okay, at best, that was just really badly done. Um, So strike Packman's comments. Uh, 
today's libertarians, like right wing libertarians, are basically fascists back in a new form. Crypto fascists. All the talk is about liberty, but the only liberty they're really interested in, unless you're really being specific about civil libertarians, but most of them are economic libertarians, the only interest that they really have is liberty for capital, not for working people. And in fact, since the interests of capital and the interests of working people are diametrically opposed, right? You go to work, your boss wants maximum profit, you want maximum pay. <laughs> like, you want to keep the value of the things that you produce, the goods and services you produce that people pay for. Yeah, you want to get the most amount per hour or per day or per year out of what you produce. The boss wants to keep the exact same money. You are diametrically opposed. So the more liberty that capital has, the more liberty they have to pursue their interests, which directly conflict with your interests. So that's libertarians of today. Now, some of these old time anarchists and like, you know, left wing anarchists that still exist today uh, actually have a lot in common with socialists. They are not crypto fascists. I mean, you get some weird anarchist takes nowadays, but that's a different story. A lot of that's because people are being diverted away from Marxism by Western intelligence interests who would much rather have you involved in anarchist fantasies. And while you're there, they're going to feed you full of like a lot of State Department propaganda as well, as much as they can stuff in along with the, uh, you know, anarchist ideology. But anyway, back in the, we'll say the pure days or even today, some of the purer strains of anarchism. Anarchists and Marxists are identical in that we both want to get rid of the bourgeois state and also the state in general. The main difference is that anarchists want to do away with the state in one stroke and then not replace it with anything, whereas Marxists want to get rid of the bourgeois state at one stroke and replace it with a worker state, which will oversee the transition from very oppressed backwards capitalist society into, over the course of however many generations, a truly free society free of exploitation, that can rule itself without a state as we have known it. No one has reached this state yet. Uh, there are still actually existing socialist states guided by communist philosophy, which at least state that they are striving towards this. No one has reached that state yet. It may need total world revolution. But keep in mind that the first socialist revolution on a national scale in Russia, that was just 100 years ago. So we are still working out exactly that process. And unfortunately, the USSR got brought down. Uh, you know, there was a lot there that unfortunately it's now on YouTube channels <laughs> to like go out and uh, preach about. So anyway, um, his, that was a bad mangling of anarchism, libertarianism, and their relationships to socialism. Modern day libertarianism is thoroughly anti-socialist, anti-communist. They're hyper capitalists. They're not socialist in any way, shape or form. And the reason they want to get rid of the government is so the capital can do whatever the fuck they want. They see themselves as these kind of like bad boys living on the edge and they just want to exploit and, uh, you know, insert libertarian pedophile joke here. So very different from anarchists who wanted to get rid of the capitalist government because capitalists were running the capitalist government or their lackeys were running the capitalist government and they wanted to decrease the influence of capitalism. Marxists and Marxist-Leninists agree with the anarchists on that. We just don't think that the anarchist method is very realistic in practice. So let's continue. Uh, they agree they, they don't want central government because it's oppressive and tyrannical, but for different reasons. And then after the utopians and after the anarchists, you get to what are now the most common versions of socialism. After utopianism and anarchism came Marxist Leninism, if we consider it together, or Marxism and then Leninism. They're not actually the same thing. And there, once again, there is stuff of value. If people could realize that many of the critiques 
made by socialism are actually really good, we'd be much better off. Some of the solutions they propose have only elements of good ideas. And in Marxism, it Okay, so before he gets into his twisted list of what is good and, you know, according to David Pakman, what you should cherry pick out of Marx, be aware, even in, when Marx was still alive, people were trying to pay homage to his influence while taking out all the ideas that were actually dangerous to capital. Lenin wrote about this extensively. So this is revisionism. People who claim to be socialists, but who take out all of the dangerous elements. And they basically reduce Marx into a common liberal. That's exactly, I'm sure, what Pacman is about to do. This is a known phenomenon. Okay? So, yeah. Otherwise, what he said is fairly accurate in that uh, Marx and Engels start in the 1840s, putting out, you know, 1840s, 1850s, and... Um, there's a lot of really significant stuff. And what they did is they did go back to the earlier socialists of the previous 50 years and other philosophers of even before that. And they critiqued them, they satirized them, and they improved it all. What they were trying to do is they were trying to basically mine all of the existing modern, you know, well, because capitalism had just, you know, if we go by what Engels wrote in the Principles of Communism that I wrote earlier. If capitalism came in with the Industrial Revolution and the steam engine and all that, well, then it had been going for, you know, a little under 100 years by the time around 1850 that Marx and Engels got their thing really going in high gear. Okay, so basically they go back to, you know, all the people who had been writing about capitalism and they said, what should we keep? And what should, what should we get rid of? Their major refinement was historical materialism. This is a huge concept. We have a lot of different things on the channel about it. Basically, this is a way of explaining changes in society throughout history by looking at what kind of technology people were using to support life and survival. So what mode of production the society was in was based on the technology that they were using. And then the social structure comes out of that. Private property, the ways that it's managed, etc. Capitalism is one of these stages or modes of production arising out of feudalism. And they put the whole thing in a context. And then they hypothesized what could be an antithesis and what could move this whole dialectic along. Dialectic is a situation where you have opposed things working against each other, propelling each other forward. More generally, it can also just mean logic. So it's the logic of how material things develop and how society develops along with them as basically part of how we survive as a species. So as part of this, they came up with, well, capitalism eventually is going to reduce everyone into proletarians, or at least the vast majority of society into proletarians who own nothing. So what then? What's going to be in the interest of the proletarians? And they came up with the solution. Well, at that point, just collectivize everything. And everyone has already been made equal by capitalism. That's not even a socialist thing. That's just the logic of how capitalism works, because capital by its own nature and logic consolidates and consolidates and consolidates. And in that process, you've already reduced society to equals. But it is the old thing that, you know, capitalists try to criticize socialists with, oh, everyone's equally poor. Literally, you just described capitalism. That is the process of proletarianization of the workforce. Once enough people have been proletarianized, you have nowhere to go but to just share things equally, unless you want to, you know, recreate a class society. But how and why? In fact, that's what the Social Democrats are arguing for. They don't mind inequality, uh, just with some constraints. And of course, you know, who, who gets to be in the better classes? Well, the deserving people, you know, namely them. And then this is, of course, totally ignoring things like imperialism, where the entire world, 
across the world, you get entire zones, entire continents in some cases that are just written off as like raw materials factories. And if you have the bad luck to be born in one of those places, you just don't have any opportunity. Sorry. Or maybe the capitalists will throw you a bone and there'll be some scholarship opportunities or something like that. But by and large, you can expect to roll those dice and come up with a life without dignity or possibility. Socialism is opposed to all of this. No one should be deciding those things. We all should have those opportunities. And in fact, we see socialism creates opportunities for working people. Capitalism never will. So anyway, more of this horrible commentary from Pacman as he tries to, uh, you know, out Marxism. This is it's reminding me a little bit of that time when Vosch tried to cherry pick quotes from Marx, Engels, Mao, Lenin to uh, gin up support for voting for Joe Biden. It's like your ideology is inferior. The capitalism is the way of the past. You're right wing. We're moving beyond you. It's going to happen. We're organizing, agitating and educating all the time. So again, enjoy your time. Because pathetic videos like this, what? At most, they're going to stall people. They're going to confuse some working people for a year or two. And then they're going to meet somebody like me. And I will teach them. And whoever else is doing this like I am is going to teach them how to rip right through it. So, you know, this is how you want to spend your time enjoying your freedom as a capitalist. While you have it, have at it, I guess. But... Anyway, it's pretty sad. The labor theory of value. Extraordinarily brilliant analysis of how capitalism works, which basically pointed out that you have fixed costs. Like if you're going to make a product, if you're going to make computers, for example, you've got your fixed material costs. You've got the factory. You need to buy the semiconductors, all of that stuff. And then you bring in workers and you pay them something with the idea that they add more than that to the total value. And that's surplus value. You might have in a hundred dollar computer, $50 of parts and then $50 of added value. If you can pay the worker $30 to add $50 of value, you've created $20 of surplus value. And you've also just ripped off your worker. So like the glint in his eye that he gets when he says that, it's literally no different than if he had just said, and if somebody pays you with a $20 bill for a $1,750 item and you give them back $150 instead of their full change, you just made a dollar. It's exactly the same. You just ripped them off. It's not clever, but that's capitalism. Why? Because capitalists have the legal right to the goods and services produced by other people using their equipment. So the capitalist owns the workplace and the equipment, which may have been paid off a long time ago. In the early days, it was one thing. All this equipment was brand new, etc. You had to finance it somehow. Even then, it could have been done cooperatively. But anyway, it's been paid for long ago. This is just outright theft. It's just because they have that legal right to rip people off. That's literally it. Capitalists have the right to rip off their employees, to pay them less, far less in most cases, than the value they produced. And they get to just keep the difference. Obviously, some of it goes into overhead and other things, or, you know, equipment upgrade, you know, the, it goes into some of that stuff, which you'd have to do even in socialism. But most of it, I mean, they're trying to keep as much of it as they can and just put it in their personal bank account. Well, that's called organized exploitation of labor for profit. It's not good. It's not clever. It's just a ripoff. This is a great analysis. This is this is an, an absolutely accurate analysis. The problem is I don't believe the ultimate solution to that identification uh, is the end stage of capitalism with a Marxist revolution. That's not what I see as the long term solution. So 
again, utopianism. I don't think it would work at the country level, but for individual companies or communes, I think it's actually a great idea to organize co-ops and, and shared ownership. Great. That has worked. We can apply it to health care. We can apply it to education. I don't see that as the solution to all of society. I mentioned it in one of the Wolf videos, the Richard Wolf videos about cooperatives. Capitalists are not threatened by cooperatives. You heard it here. They're not threatened by them. The only thing that really threatens them is publicly run industry not for profit. That's it. That's what they really don't want because they cannot compete with it. They cannot keep getting profits. You can't, you can't compete with free, you know? You can't compete with that. Not that it's 100% free, but you know what I mean. Whereas co ops, basically are just collectivized private businesses. It's not really the same. So they don't mind that. Just wanted to point that out. Also, I hope at some point he gets to what is his solution. And also, he doesn't say why. He doesn't say why. He's like, I don't feel that that's... Okay, why don't you feel that? Because authoritarianism? Is that why? Because that's an empty response. It's devoid of any real content, any practical meaning, because it's authoritarian. Well, capitalism, we live in a fucking police state in the United States. Pretty sure that's fairly authoritarian. The largest prison population per capita by far on the planet. Is this not authoritarian? Like, it's no, it's only authoritarian if you infringe on capital. That's how these people think. Continuing. Anarchism, skeptical of government. Government has become a tool of the elites in many ways. We see it in the United States with Democrats and Republicans using government as a way to maintain the status quo. It's a good critique. I disagree that eliminating government is the solution. And so what. OK, so before he goes on with the end, so note the framing. According to Pacman, anarchists are correct in some ways about government contributing to oppression and inequality because it, quote, has become a tool of the elites, in his words. Note the framing has become. This implies it's ever been anything other than that. Capitalists have been the ruling class forever in the United States. It's, it's working people have never been anything more than a counterpower. Our power as a class, workers, peaked around World War II, from the 30s to the 50s. Uh, the second Red Scare particularly broke it. But if you want to see the peak of like the labor movement and socialist movements and everything like that, that was it. That was, that was a high watermark, okay? Union membership peaked in 1960, has been in decline ever since. That's not the sign of working class ascendancy, okay? It's always been the capitalists in charge. They just temporarily rolled out some concessions to save their system. It's not that it has become a tool of the elites. It always was. But this is what social Democrats want you to think. That, you know, oh, capitalist government, sometimes it works for capitalists, sometimes it works for work. No, no. It always works for capitalists. It's just sometimes some factions of capitalists think that it's in the best interest of their overall system to be a little kinder to workers. That's it. It's in the interest of the stability of their own system. They want, they want to perpetuate it. They want the profits to roll in forever. Capitalism is inherently unstable and tends towards consolidation and inequality with massive upheavals and crashes and all kinds of things along the way built into it. Those are features of capitalism. And, you know, they're always looking for ways to extend it a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. This guy's no fucking different. But he, like every other social Democrat, is out there trying to sell you on, no, 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 this is peak human civilization. It cannot get better than regulated capitalism. Let the capitalists keep picking your pocket. Let them keep exploiting your surplus value. Let rampant inequality continue, because it still goes on under social democracy. 
we can't do any better. That's always their message, and it's wrong. Previously had been sort of a cohesive movement, but with different approaches, utopianism, anarchism, Marxism, Leninism, eventually. All right, that reminds me, I'm jumping back in after like two seconds. I got sidetracked and derailed, so my apologies. But Marxism, we were talking about all this before. I'm sorry, there's so much bullshit here. It's, it's hard to like wade through all of it and try to, you know, sanitize and disinfect everything. Talking about Marxism and Marxism-Leninism. As I mentioned, Marx and Engels got going in the 1840s, 1850s. Marx then died a couple decades later. Engels died a couple decades after that. Lenin did die a couple decades after that, but also after Marx and Engels had both died prior to 1900, Lenin, as a revolutionary who was actively involved in movements in Europe and Russia, uh, added just incredible writings. I, I've done, I think, more Lenin than any other audiobooks on this channel. He's a fantastic writer. Um, there are definitely some of his writings I like more than others, but on the whole, really, really good additions. And if Marx and Engels were writing about 19th century capitalism, Lenin brought it into the 20th century with works like imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, and basically saying imperialism was the capitalism of the 20th century. True, because capitalism, as it consolidates, as it expands, as it, uh, you know, well, consolidates into fewer hands on the one hand and expands its territory on the other with that increased consolidated power, expands its territory to more you know, expanses of the globe, um, it behaves a little bit differently. And we saw, for example, World War I and World War II, which were clashes between capitalists. You had like the UK and France as the more entrenched old school capitalists. And then the upstarts like Germany vying for who's going to be top dog within the imperialist order. It's basically what World War I and World War II were. They were clashes between capitalists for who was going to be top dog imperialist, and who was going to set the tone. And of course, that, you know, those contests were settled. The torch got passed to the United States, this fresh new country that, uh, you know, has become the monster that it is. The United States, I mean, while you definitely, like, can walk around the United States in some places and enjoy your day, and you can even go to school for a certain price and do all these other things, there's also really, really horrific aspects to what the United States does throughout the world, how U.S. led imperialism through financial institutions drain countries of their surplus value. Um, it really, truly is horrific, and all of this needs to change. But he's really skimming over <laughs> Marx and Engels' time in the 19th century, 1800s, mid mid to late 1800s, and then Lenin in the, you know, tail end of the 19th century, going into the 20th century, 1900s, 19-teens, 1920s, and of course, being a major leader in the Russian Revolution, overseeing the first national scale revolution for socialism. So, uh, kind of not a thing you want to gloss over. <laughs> like, there's a reason Marxism-Leninism is a thing. Um, Lenin made substantial additional contributions to Marx and Engels, bringing Marxist thought into the 20th century with a very sharp and critical eye and tongue or pen. Uh, much the same way, you know, Marx and Engels, as I mentioned, satirized, critiqued ruthlessly. Uh, Marx is not only brilliant, but also hilarious and like actually really like very funny, uh, you know, can get dry in places. But sometimes when he is mocking contemporaries or forerunners, um, can be very funny in the way that he points out their shortcomings or just mocks them. Uh, Lenin, same way, I think is a little more sarcastic, but similar. They're, they're responding to other movements and always trying to refine and improve what the socialist movement as a whole is doing and is capable of trying to refine that critical thought into something really powerfully useful. Um, anyway, 
you know, different styles, but some similar tactics and uh, both are great writers. So anyway, getting back to someone not the greatest thinker, more Pacman. Actually, what we saw around the time of Lenin was a split between actual socialists and those who went in the direction of social democracy. And I believe that there are a number of reasons why social democracy is the way forward and socialism is not. And in explaining this to you, you'll identify many right wing arguments against socialism, which I actually don't think are good ones. And this gets to one of my fundamental oppositions to socialism's view of the distributions of outcomes versus social democracies. Socialism in the Marxist Leninin, Leninist sort of tradition is simply not aligned with the realities of human distribution, because when we look at human endeavors, He's really doing a human nature argument. This is unbelievable. Like this is, I thought we were at bottom tier before. We're finding new basement layers. This is awful. Um, not to mention it's a caricature of how socialist countries have actually done things. You can't just lump everything all together. He's being so general here. And like, what countries are you talking about? Can you show some specific examples? And then even within those countries, what time period? Because different socialist countries tried different systems or they implemented different systems at different times as their development, you know, their developmental needs dictated. So now we're just going into like these broad brush things. So with that said, as a grain of salt to take the incoming comments with, Let's also just mention briefly what he said around the time of the Russian Revolution, Lenin's time, the 1900s, 19 teens. There was a split between. Well, in Russia, you had the Bolshevik faction. This was Lenin and Stalin's faction and Trotsky. These were the you know, eventually they would come to call themselves communists. At this time, the whole thing was called social democracy. That was just the term back then. Um, but you also had other factions that were not Bolsheviks. They were Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries or social revolutionaries. Those other two, the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries, when the revolution actually started happening in 1917, sided with the capitalists. It wasn't just a disagreement of tactics with the Bolsheviks on a particular policy. When the czar was deposed and there was the po power vacuum and the possibility to find a new way to run Russia, uh, a new system of government. The Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries sided with the cadet party, the new capitalist party. And the capitalists were all about trying to just carve up, you know, I mean, just they were eager to get into this imperialism game. And Lenin's faction, the Bolsheviks, were like, the fuck are you doing? And uh, between February and October of 1917, the Bolsheviks do, in large part, I would say, to Lenin's extremely gifted leadership, that guy didn't miss a thing. Uh, I mean, I'm sure he missed, he's human, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's an expression. So... <laughs> Uh, the guy, the guy was just, he had such an eye and was so clever and in the best way possible. So, um, they managed to outmaneuver during this time of transition between February and October and the Bolsheviks gained the upper hand and, uh, you know, the rest is history. So it wasn't just a split in tactics. Those other factions were counter revolutionary. All they wanted to do was get rid of the czar and then help the capitalists get set up in exchange for a few extra biscuits. So what do we see today? You know, you look at, for example, oh, we got to get rid of Trump. We got to get it's like kind of the same thing where the problem is recharacterized and mischaracterized as just a problem with a particular ruler without looking at the class dynamics of what class is in charge. And it's anti-revolutionary, counter-revolutionary, you know, well, it's anti-revolutionary in that it basically doesn't seek a change in who is ruling. Uh, and again, you know, these Mensheviks and social revolutionaries sidled right up with the incoming capitalist party.
hoping to take power along with them. And then counter-revolutionary, when the Bolsheviks stood up and said, hey, we have a chance to actually do this, they stood in their way. They tried to counter that revolution. And then, of course, there was a five-year civil war after that. That's very counter-revolutionary indeed. Uh, A civil war on the one side fighting for workers' revolution, and then on the other side fighting against it, fighting for capitalist control so that Russia's capitalist class and their lackeys in the Menshevik factions, the Social Democrats, could, uh, you know, get their piece of the pie. So that's who this rat fuck on your screen is rooting for in these situations. Let's continue. They have unequal distribution. If you look at athletic ability and how it's distributed, if you look at linguistic proficiency, if you look at business success, if you look at human height, human weight, it's all distributed on a curve. And on the one hand, where socialism wants to level out the distribution in a way that I've not seen evidence can actually be achieved without significant downsides, what social democracy wants to do is tweak that distribution, lower the uh, 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 absolute top, raise the bottom a little bit, and then reduce the gap between the very bottom and the very top. You're- this is so bad. At at the very best, this guy is massively ignorant. So first of all, everywhere that capitalism has been introduced, it creates progressive amounts of inequality more and more with time. You cannot just hit this equilibrium point with capitalism that he's talking about. Okay, you want some economic compression. Yeah, we achieved that during the New Deal. Then what happened? Capitalists fought back. They stopped playing dead. They beat back the labor movement and they reasserted their power. And then we got neoliberalism late 70s into the 80s up to today. And it's a complete shit show. Capitalism is not a static system. It doesn't work like this. You cannot leave industry in private hands and expect some kind of static outcome. There's so many things he's overlooking here, not to mention that this ridiculous caricature of, quote, what socialists want is not even remotely on base. Let's just, I just want to get through this at this point. This is trash. Sort of leveling it out. You're raising the mean and reducing the difference between top and bottom. I think it's important to look at Sweden as an example. The right hates looking at Sweden. Sweden's social democratic party, which I identify with, was built on five principles that will sound really familiar to social Democrats, to people who follow Bernie Sanders. And those five principles were, number one, an integrative democracy. That means, and we can leave this up, that means that democratic decision making is the standard for legitimacy, period. Real democracy, the people decide the direction. Number two, the concept of the people's home, meaning solidarity and equality of treatment as something that everybody is committed to. There's no debate, right? You need that. Number three, socioeconomic equality and economic efficiency are complementary. These are often considered opposing forces by the capitalists, right? The, 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 The vulture capitalists, which is you can either have an economically efficient society or one that is more equal. The social democratic tradition actually sees those as complementary. Number four, you have a socially controlled market economy. And this is huge. It's still a market economy. It's still capitalism. But the economy's direction and the priorities are determined socially. Doesn't mean society owns the means of production, as in socialism, but society guides the market economy. And fifth, proper expansion of the public sector expands freedom and freedom of choice. Think about it. Healthcare for all lets people get the jobs that are actually their passion. Socialized education means that people can really study what they want rather than deciding on the cheapest career to avoid student loans. This is all in line with my ideology. Okay, yes, it clearly is in line with your ideology. I don't contest that. I want to point out something right off the bat. Look down at the bottom in the fine print. Source. Socialism, a very short introduction. So, you know, Pacman goes on this whole thing railing against, you know, what do people mean by socialism? Then the example he holds up of what he believes in labels it socialism. I just 
that's there's a certain really delicious irony in that. Anyway, regardless, um, you know, I talked about a lot of this before, but it's like, okay, so you like the Swedish Social Democratic Party. Wonderful. As far as I'm aware, they're globally inconsequential. They're part of the imperialist system. They're integrated with that. They're a client state of that. Great. Um, but, you know, again, versus, say, a developing exploited country like a Venezuela, um, do you have the same geopolitical situation and position within the world economy that can support something like this being done? Because that's a factor. You're not even... I mean, just even the United States, because, you know, Pacman's in the United States and he, he's a U.S. social democrat. It's like, I haven't heard a single mention of international trade in this entire discussion. We live in a globalized world, a globalized world that runs on violence. And the only countries exempt from that are countries that have had some kind of a socialist revolution and taking, taken themselves out of imperialist hands. And, you know, even then you, you get hit with sanctions and everything else. But the point is, you look at these things. How do you get there? And how do you get there in a country like the United States, which is the world purveyor of imperialist violence? It's not even remotely in line with the interests of the ruling class of the country. They're not going to do this. I mean, Sweden, I can only assume, is just aimed at pacifying their population. And they're not an, like as much of an active player. Uh, they don't have to, like the United States, provide an endless supply of fresh meat for the military you know, this just string of grunts that have no education and have no hopes. And so you get the poverty draft and all that kind of thing. It's like these analysis, these points of analysis have completely eluded this guy. He lives in his little world of being a rich liberal and just kind of like tunes out everything that isn't in line with that. Guess what? Most of the world doesn't run on this logic. Most of the world doesn't have anything close to your standard of living, not even remotely close. So, you know, and then as far as some of these other points, like a socially controlled market economy, we went through this with the wolf and destiny stuff. These, this is, markets help to introduce inequality. I mean, they're very inefficient for one thing. Market anarchy is one of the things we're trying to get away from with socialism. They create enormous amounts of waste and redundancy. But also in markets, the people with the most money get the goods. People selling things in a market want the most money that they can get. Therefore, the people with the most money can pay more than other people, and then they get the things, and then the prices go up, and it's another driver of inequality, and it helps to cement inequality. Again, he's looking at this as a static system in isolation without any concerns of you know differing levels of development across the globe or imperialist aggression. And um, just trying to do this in your little fucking snow globe of Sweden. I mean, looks, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll turn around and hit you with, you know, looks nice on paper. You haven't factored in anything. Uh, well, let's see. There's a few more minutes of this. Maybe he gets to something about more than just domestic policy at some point, which, you know, par for the course in a lot of these sock them videos, you know, they're they're pro Democratic Party. I believe that the major task at this stage for the U.S. left and maybe for, you know, I can mostly speak to that, but the U.S. left needs to pull out of the Democratic Party and make an independent left organization, whether it's a coalition or whatever it is, we need an independent left and to get out of the Democratic Party. People like this want to pull you into the Democratic Party. And again, it's like some focus on domestic policy. It's a little bit better than the Republicans, for example. But neither party wants to do anything challenging imperialism because the whole fucking system, the entire baseline of wealth of the country comes to the country through violence and exploitation. And they just don't want to look at that. Let's continue. Maybe he mentioned it. But it still exists within a capitalist market economy that allows for entrepreneurship and individualization and all of the good things that come from the natural diversity of people. 
Now, when you talk about Sweden and you talk to the right, they will try to destroy these talking points, and you've got to know how they try to do it. A popular one is, okay, that, that worked in Sweden because Sweden is homogenous. It's all white. It wouldn't work in a diverse country. This is patently absurd, okay? The U.S. is 77% white. Sweden is 85% white, okay? The okay, pause. I don't know where he got that from, but non-Hispanic white people in the United States are actually more like 60% of the population. So that's a huge distortion off the bat. Even if you counted all Hispanic people as white, which not all Hispanic people are white, um, you'd get around that 77% number, but that's definitely not accurate for the reason I just stated. Also, I'd like to make a point here. So we are intersectional Marxists here at Socialism for All. This really bothers some really stone-brained people who don't understand that, yes, while class is ultimately the major contradiction, racism, sexism, heterosexism, and other forms of major institutionalized bigotry and prejudice have been a major part of the way that capitalism has entrenched itself so firmly in the United States. Capitalism in the United States would not be nearly as durable as it is if it did not rely on an intertwining of itself with racist, sexist, and other kinds of bigoted ideologies. It's just a fact. So when we're trying to undo capitalism, we also have to undo racism and sexism. They're not the same as class. It's, you know, class, race, gender. They're separate social statuses. But if we're trying to have a class-based revolution as Marxists, you can't do that without looking at race and sex as well, because that's part of how divisions in the working class have been created that keep us apart. And you can't just take a colorblind sex-blind, gender-blind approach that doesn't work in any direction, uh, really. It just helps oppressors when you say, well, oh, I don't look at that stuff. Well, they're actually, though, a part of history and actually existing ideology today affecting working people, and you saying that is actually driving people off who can see plain as day in their life that those institutionalized forms of bigotry are keeping them down. And this is going to be potentially a huge barrier to having any kind of an integrated socialist movement and therefore a successful socialist movement. All right. Topic for another time in more detail. But yes, you need an intersectional Marxism, particularly in a country like the U.S., where capitalism here has totally thrived off of the fertilizers of racism and sexism and so on. It's a country built on racialized genocide and slavery. There are deep racial hierarchies throughout the class structure. Trying to like deal with the class structure without dealing with those things is impossible. So anyway, but that feeds back into the thing of Sweden. They don't have that same history. So uh, Pacman's lying there about the statistics in the first place. But beyond that, Sweden and the U.S. don't have the same relationships with racial violence, the same particular relationships, at least. So, you know, I'm not saying social democracy is not going to work because, you know, races inherently hate each other or whatever, like right wingers say, you know, right wing arguments against equality involving race don't really make much sense. And they're little more than what I was just talking about. They're little more than some capitalist didn't want to pay out, so he made up some crazy shit about race that you know, some moron right-winger is going to walk around repeating, and it just helps the capitalist not pay out that money you know, or give up power or whatever, whatever the thing is. So um, anyway, very shaky footing here to start. Let's proceed. The idea that those eight percentage points are what make a system work in Sweden and not in the U.S., 
is absolutely laughable. It's also funny the hypocrisy that many right wingers simultaneously claim Sweden is being taken over by brown immigrants and it's chaos. But at the same time, Sweden works really well because everybody is white. That should make everybody say, wait, wait a second. That doesn't. Well, no, uh, I don't agree with the right wing point of view, but actually Pacman is misconstruing it. What my understanding of what the right wingers are saying is that we built this nice system during a racially homogeneous period. And if all these people who are not of our race and ethnicity come into it, then they're going to ruin it. I'm pretty sure that that's what the argument is. So not not a not a great thinker here, Pacman. It really makes sense. Consider the counterpoint. If the United States were all white, would the Swedish model work? It's absurd. The United States is huge. And with such differences in education and religion and so many other things, just making the U.S. all white would not be what either makes or doesn't make the Swedish system work. Now, here's where the critique actually defends social democracy over socialism. A totally socialist society, whether Marxist or utopian or anarchist or Leninist in the U.S., would actually be impossible. But what wouldn't be impossible? Wait a minute. Why? Because you called it authoritarian. Why wouldn't it work? Break it down. I don't know if he's coming back to this, but a <laughs> little sleight of hand there. He was just like, now it wouldn't work. But moving on. Wait a minute. No, you didn't say anything. So we just skipped over that. And in fact, uh, you know, I mentioned I had gotten sidetracked before when he was talking about, you know, Marx had some great points and then it turned into Marxism, Leninism. Anyway, moving on. It's like he just wants to completely skip over Marxism, Leninism and the founding of the USSR and the Chinese revolution and Vietnam. And it, like he wants to just, you know, obliterate the his example of actually existing socialism was not Korea and it wasn't cute. It was Venezuela. I, I'm just like stunned. He doesn't have the guts to attack any of the uh, like literally every time he mentions Marxism, Leninism, he quickly changes the subject right afterwards. I'm noticing here took me like the second or third time to see it, but He's just changing the subject. He has not really addressed that head on. And right there is confirmation. I mean, that's a prime example. So anyway, I want to address this other like weird hypothetical he threw out and again, didn't really explain if the USA were all white, if the USA were racially homogeneous and that something about, well, it wouldn't work because people are different levels of education, whatever else. I didn't really get the point he was making there, um, except to say that well, actually, this kind of goes more into what I was saying. If the USA were all white, we would still have infighting anyway. Why? Because capitalists engender that and they stoke that infighting. Uh, prime example. So the KKK, many of you, probably all of you are familiar with the KKK, uh, racist terrorist organization. Probably everyone knows about the KKK's targeting of black people, uh, maybe slightly lesser known targeting of Jewish people. Uh, one of the very least known things is that in places where there really weren't racial uh, minorities so much, people who like looked super different, you know, color of skin and things like that, the KKK would go after Catholics in Protestant dominated areas, which the United States by and large, you know, has been particularly in uh, the days when the KKK was the strongest. But yeah, they would go after Catholics. So it was like whatever groups that these terrorists could, uh, you know, isolate to get division uh, in the working class. And that kind of, you know, they're taking our jobs thing. It's like, oh, it's the these people who, you know, the whole purpose of organizations like that is to keep you looking down at other segments of the working class, whether it's, oh, it's the Jews, it's the Catholics, it's what anything to keep you from looking up at the capitalists, the people who actually have the money, the power, the control of the courts, of property rights, of the deeds to the means of production. That's what those people are there for. They're to keep you in fear and hating and fearing each other and infighting. And this is part of why we need intersectional Marxism, because after generations of this, you need anti-racist and anti-sexist 
training and anti-heterosexist training to re-socialize people, to be able to break out of what the capitalists have taught us if you want people to be able to work together against them, which is what we want as socialists. So I had some idiot in the comments like, Id Paul, and this was on the, uh, is China socialist? The first comment I got was, uh, Id Paul is anti-socialist. First of all, that had nothing to do with identity politics. Second of all, you're wrong. Identity politics are important to understand. Class even is a form of identity politics, what we deal with as Marxists, insofar as your class is part of your social identity. We treat it a little bit differently as Marxists in pursuit of a class-based revolution, but it is a social status. I've said it before, the problem with liberal idpol or liberal identity politics is that, well, it's anti-socialist. It tries to reduce class at best to being on equal footing with the other statuses and uh, definitely doesn't want a class-based revolution. And sometimes it sort of tries to erase class entirely, thereby paving the way for more of a class collaborationist approach. Obviously, we don't want that. But you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. They've taken identity politics and perverted it. So the problem with liberal idpol is the liberalism, not the understanding of social statuses and their place in oppressing people. Hope that's clear. I keep having to say this. Uh, eventually, I, I hope it'll sink in for everyone. Anyway, uh, Pacman really doesn't have very good points here. I think I'm like uh, working overtime trying to like add uh, value to this video over and above what he is saying. Um, so anyway, let's get back to that. Possible would be socializing certain elements of American society. Healthcare, for example. Very doable. Large countries socialize health care. Education. Education could be put into sort of the umbrella of social welfare in the United States. That's the social democratic model that I support. One other argument from the right, which is they say it works in Sweden because Sweden is small and the U.S. is big. That's part of why I believe that total socialism actually is not the path forward but that there are socializable components which would work absolutely fine in the United States. So to sort of give you the highlights of why I'm not a socialist and I am a social democrat. So before he does that, I was actually just making a note on this topic. He hasn't said anything in this video so far. He said that he is not a socialist because one, it's authoritarian, two, it's impossible, and three, human nature. That is what he has said so far. There has been literally nothing specific aside from, I think the most specific he got was listing a few things like, you know, press freedom in Venezuela, which again, not very specific, but that was as specific as it got. So one, it's authoritarian. Two, and literally I'm not straw manning here in the slightest. That's all he said. He didn't even really expand on it. No specific examples. Very vague. So one, it's authoritarian. Two, it's impossible. End of quote. Like nothing else was said. And three, human nature. It's on a bell curve or some fucking thing. Are you serious? Like that? So he made a 17 minute video, which I'm now adding like over an hour worth of comments to. Um, just pointing out the absolute impoverishment of the thought here. I mean, there's nothing here. Maybe in the last two minutes of this video, he's going to bust out his actual arguments, although I'm inclined to doubt it. He has said nothing. And then, to boot, not only has he completely not even mentioned the USSR, China, other actually existing or at one time existing socialist entities, he then starts to fucking debate phantom right-wingers on Sweden. So this is a guy who has nothing to say to real socialists besides uh, authoritarian, uh, impossible, human nature, bro, and Venezuela. Boom, done. That was it. Like, that was really it. This guy is a capitalist who wants universal health care. 
and maybe like cheaper college tuition. That's that's it. Guess what? When you leave the dynamics of that whole system in place, you're going to be cons- well, first of all, you're not going to be able to institute them to begin with. Second of all, even if you do, you're going to be constantly fighting against the capitalists who are going to be trying to take them away. The only reason they wouldn't is just out of fear for their entire system, which how do you give them that fear? Definitely not by making the kinds of arguments that he's making. I believe that a socially directed market economy that reduces income inequality and ensures a real standard of living for everybody is more realistic. And it's also more in line with human nature, which uh, uh, actually shows that there is distribution when it comes to any endeavor that humans get involved in. And I fundamentally and this gets back to the real reason that I so vehemently oppose uh, what we see going on in Venezuela and what we see in, and have seen in other places around the world. I do not believe because I've seen no evidence that an egalitarian, self-determining free society will develop from an authoritarian apparatus, period. I'm willing to change my mind. So let me know your thoughts. I'm on Twitter at D Pacman and the show is on Twitter at David Pacman show. And I look forward to dialogue on this issue going forward. I'm really thrilled to tell you that today's program is made possible in part by betterhelp.com. Okay, <laughs> I'm assuming at this point, the remaining two minutes of the video are just advertisements. Um, you got nothing. I mean, that's my basic response. So he talks about, you know, the socially directed market economy. Is Sweden your only example? I mean, vague generalities. That's the best we got here. And no substantial criticisms of anything other than, you know, naming a couple of points in passing, which very well might be refuted if we knew the specifics uh, in terms of assertions about Venezuela. I I give it an F. D minus if I'm feeling charitable, because at least he put in the effort. But this is terrible. This is a this is a joke. So um, if you want to learn about actual socialism, don't get it from guys like this. Go to the source. We do audiobooks here, and then we do current events and historical analysis based off of history and theory. You know? This is how people who have actually made change do things. Not by listening to comfortable, smug, rich liberals like this guy insulting your intelligence. So with that, this thing is mercifully over. Thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. If donations are not your thing, understandable, this is not a good economy. You can uh, like, share, subscribe, comment. All of that helps to boost the channel. Anywhere that you can spread these into left-wing Facebook groups, on Twitter. I am on Twitter at SocialismS4A. On Reddit, wherever you are, uh, that does help to put this material in front of more eyeballs and expand the conversation because we have got to end capitalism. Whatever it is you do to do that, Thanks for doing it, not just for this channel, obviously, but for the movement. And uh, we'll catch you in the next video. Take care.